So I'd like to begin by thanking my various uh, grad students and collaborators uh, at the Center for Human Compatible AI. Um, and I'm going to begin by saying something that's in some circles extremely controversial, but I hope that we don't have to argue about it. Uh, eventually, AI systems will be making better decisions than us uh, in the real world. And they, they will be able to do that because they will have access to essentially all the information in the world. And uh, you know, like AlphaGo, they'll be able to look further ahead into the future than we can. Uh, we are still some way from this. Um, but this was anticipated as a problem a long time ago. Here's a quote. Even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. Um, and this is, this is not Elon Musk. Uh, this is not Bill Gates. This is not Stephen Hawking. This is Alan Turing in 1951. Um, and he said similar things on several occasions, uh, that machines would eventually overtake humans. And uh, he's quite resigned to this. He just basically says, we're toast. Um, and so we could describe this as the gorilla problem, right? Because gorillas you know, also made, you know, or at least their ancestors did, a new species, namely us, a few million years ago. And, and they're having a meeting here to discuss whether this was a good idea. <laughs> and you can see just from the body language, no, this is a terrible idea, right? This is really, really bad for gorillas to, to bring into existence this species that can just outthink them. Um, now, if that's the problem, then the only solution is just to stop doing AI. Uh, which is hard to do, you know, even if everyone in this room said, yeah, you know, we agree, uh, let's all stop doing AI. There is a bunch of people out there who see a prize bigger than the GDP of the world. Uh, they're not going to stop trying to achieve that goal. Um, so we have to figure out more about what the problem is uh, and can we avoid the problem, right? Can we, can we avoid ending up like the gorillas? So, Here's a useful clue. We had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Uh, now, this was from uh, a paper written by Norbert Wiener in 1960. Um, as you know, he's a very famous mathematician, the founder of cybernetics, um, but also thought a lot about the impact of technology on human society. And he wrote this when he had just seen Arthur Samuel's checker playing program uh, learn to play checkers better than its creator. Uh, and he sort of extrapolated and said, OK, we better start thinking about how to avoid uh, this problem. And so the problem is not a new one to the human race. You could say that this is you know, the King Midas problem. Right? King Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. He got exactly what he asked for. And of course, his food and his drink and his relatives turned to gold. And, he was extremely upset and died in misery and starvation. Is that uh, what we want for ourselves? And can we avoid uh, suffering this fate, right? That we put the wrong purpose into the machine, whether it's you know, cure cancer, and, and then we find that the machine is using everyone on the planet as a guinea pig. Um, is it that we ask the machine you know, to solve the global warming problem, and it uses up half the oxygen in the atmosphere in doing so. Um, the ways in which things can go wrong cannot be anticipated. So I can enumerate some ways. And of course, since I can enumerate them, I could anticipate them. But I can't enumerate all of them, because I'm not as intelligent as the machine. Uh, you will find ways uh, to achieve specific objectives that we may not be happy with. Um, and so how do we avoid that? So what we would like is that the AI systems we build are provably beneficial, not that we think they're well designed or you know, that we've taken into account many of these considerations, but we want a proof. And nothing less than that would suffice. Um, and it's almost an oxymoron, because beneficial is a very ill-defined thing. Right? We don't really know what is beneficial or not. So the game with AI is always 
the following, right? We define a formal problem, whether it's a logical planning problem or a markup decision process or whatever else you choose, and we're going to have to assume, for the sake of argument, that the, the robot's going to solve it arbitrarily well. Now, we could take into account you know, complexity and decidability limitations on the robot, and perhaps that will help us a bit. But I think for, for, this, for now, we're just going to assume that it's going to solve it arbitrarily well. Um, and it's important to know that we get to say what this F is. There's, there's a lot of discussion um, around this issue, um, particularly in what we call the AGI community, which is a, a offshoot of AI where people are concerned about superintelligent machines specifically, where they just assume that the AGI is a black box that lands from outer space uh, and it's arbitrarily intelligent. That problem is unsolvable. Right? If a black box from outer space and lands and it's much more intelligent than we are, then we are toast. Right? So it's got, you know, our ability to control this, uh, this technology has got to come from the fact that we design it the right way. Um, and then what we would like is a theorem saying that uh, you know, if you have an F-solver, you're provably better off with the F-solver than if you didn't have it, okay? Or at least provably not worse off. And the, the problem that we're trying to avoid is inherent in the way that AI is currently conceived. So the way we do AI right now is um, we come up with very, very clever algorithms, whether they're deep learners or deep reinforcement learners or MDP solvers or whatever. We give them an objective. You know, if it's machine learning, it's you know, least squares with a loss matrix. If it's an MDP, it's a reward function. If it's a logical planning system, it's a goal. We give them the objective, um, and then they optimize. Uh, and you know, eventually, when they're out there in the real world, they will optimize and carry out uh, that solution. And if your objective is misaligned, uh, if the objective you give is misaligned with your, your true objective, as, as Wiener pointed out, um, and your AI system is operating you know, in a space where it can have a global impact, uh, and that can be done by you know, any system that's connected to the web uh, can have a global impact. So it's not, it's not a very special condition. Then you're going to have um, serious problems. You know, if we're lucky, those problems might be you know, on the scale of Chernobyl, uh, and we can sort of learn our lesson and say, OK, we better take this seriously. Uh, if we're not lucky, they might be much worse. Um, so how do, we, how do we avoid this problem? And the, the basic answer is, in some sense, sort of obvious. You don't give the AI system a specific objective. OK. Um, so the way it goes is we say, what the machine is doing is trying to optimize human preferences, but it's explicitly uncertain about what those are. So it does not have a, a fixed specific objective. In order to become useful, it has to get better at understanding what the uh, true human preferences are, right? If it's, you know, if it's completely neutral about what our preferences are, it won't be completely useless. Um, so in order to obtain more information, it needs contingent exposure to human beings. And so human beings necessarily have a, a formal role to play in the definition of this problem. Um, and to me, this is unavoidable, right, because that's what we're doing AI for, right? If you're worried, um, you know, as Nick Bostrom is, about an AI system that's going to cover the world with paperclips because you just told it to go sit in the corner and make some paperclips, right? Uh, what's bad about that? Well, it's bad for humans, but it's not bad for this guy. This is a bacteria that eats iron, right? He's thrilled with the, uh, the world being covered in paperclips, right? So, so, so this indexicality of the formal problem uh, to humans is is just unavoidable. They're going to have to have a distinguished uh, formal role uh, in the mathematical theory. So let me talk about one of those three points, right? The, the point about uncertainty and objectives. And, um, you know, uncertainty has been around in AI, uh, you know, since the early 80s, it, it became uh, obvious that, you know, strictly logic-based methods couldn't cope with the real world, because there's uncertainty in sensing, there's uncertainty in your knowledge of the, 
uh, dynamics of the domain, uh, and so on. And so people started using probability theory, uh, and that became uh, really almost the definition of the modern period of AI. But uncertainty in objectives was completely ignored. And there's a good reason why it was completely ignored, because it's actually mathematically irrelevant. Right? If you have uncertainty over the reward function in an MDP, um, then you just simply integrate it out, you replace that distribution with its expectation, uh, and you'll get exactly the same behavior. Right? Because everything is linear, and you're maximizing expectations anyway, so uh, it doesn't make any difference to the optimal policy in an MDP. So it's not surprising that people didn't pay any attention to it. Um, but that theorem isn't true in the case where the environment can provide further information about the objective. Right? And this is uh, a crucial point, because according to the, the third point uh, on the slide, if you have contingent exposure to humans, human actions provide information uh, by the usual revealed preference uh, concept uh, about their underlying uh, objectives, their underlying preferences. So if I think about, you know, so now I, I think about how I wrote the first three editions of, of the AI textbook that I wrote starting in 94. Um, and in those three editions, this is kind of the picture that you have. There's a human objective, and we assume that it's observed, right? We assume that the value of the objective is known. Now, the, value, the, the human objective affects human behavior, um, and if you give it to the machine, it's going to affect the machine behavior. And so I've drawn this as a kind of a graphical model, um, and in graphical models, if that variable in the middle is observed, then the variable on the left is irrelevant to the machine behavior. Right? Um, the human objective is just a sufficient statistic for how the human and the machine communicate. Once the machine knows the objective, the human doesn't matter anymore. And that's kind of the problem, right? Then you get the single-minded pursuit of curing cancer or solving global warming or whatever, and the human could be jumping up and down and saying, no, 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 but it's too late. You've given the objective, right? So it, obviously, the interaction could be more complicated than that, but this is the basic um, problem in pictorial form. If the human objective is unknown, then you can't decouple the two things. In fact, the human and the machine behavior are necessarily mathematically going to be coupled together, and you have to think about this as a multi-agent uh, decision problem. Um, and I've, I just found this quite helpful uh, when looking at various problems that were already arising. Um, and uh, you know, one of those was Google's catastrophic failure of its image classification algorithm categorizing um, humans as gorillas. You know, how could that happen, right? I mean, their image classification algorithm is, you know, is pretty good, right? But yet, it probably costs them a couple of billion dollars in, you know, bad public relations and, and running around trying to fix it, and, and uh, you know, then people start talking more about regulation, and it make, you know, made uh, Google's life very painful. Um, so how did it happen? Well, it happened because they were using a, uh, an, an image classification machine learning algorithm with a loss matrix, uh, and that loss matrix was uniform, meaning that the cost of misclassifying any object as any other is the same, right? So misclassifying you know, a poodle as a Maltese is just the same as the cost of misclassifying a human as a gorilla, right? So they simply put the objective in. It was the wrong one. They probably never even thought, what am I putting in here? Because in machine learning competitions, the uniform loss matrix is the metric that we use, right? But the real world isn't a machine learning competition. Uh, and so I, don't, I think they never thought about what the loss matrix should be. If they had thought about it, they would have said, well, it's probably pretty complicated. We're actually not really sure yet how we should assign cost to all these. And they should have put, uh, you know, the, the learning algorithm should have started with a great deal of uncertainty about that loss matrix. They should start thinking about, you know, what is the form of the prior over loss matrices? How is it structured? Right? It's not just a distribution over one million entries in that, in that loss matrix. Uh, it has a lot more structure. So it creates a whole new sort of sub-discipline of machine learning. It also creates algorithms that should be entitled to say, I'm not going to classify that image, right? Because I don't know whether 
uh, it's going to cost you a lot if I make a mistake. Right? And uh, so, so these kinds of things you just don't see ordinary learning algorithms doing because that's, uh, you know, they're solving a different problem. Um, another example is just to think about something very, very simple. You know, we've thought about um, giving tasks to robots for decades. You know, you give the robot a task of fetching the coffee. Uh, the robot calculates a plan for fetching the coffee, goes and fetches the coffee, and, and comes back. Right? Now, in the real world, this is much, much more complicated. Right? You know, if, if you're in the Georges Sank in Paris and you send your robot to get the coffee, you, know, you might regret it because it's 21 euros for a cup of coffee. Right? You would like the robot to say, boss, the coffee's 21 euros. Are you sure you want me to buy this? You know, um, and so we should stop thinking about these things as instructions. Right? They're not an instruction to a human. Right? The human is, is not carrying out this as its sole mission, in, as his or her sole mission in life, uh, to get the coffee at all costs. Right? That's just not what we do. What we do is we take your request as an indication that, you know, contrary to our prior, right, since we weren't already on the way to fetch you coffee, right, so our prior was, you know, you don't really care, you say I'd like coffee, now you update that your, your current value of coffee is a little bit higher, than what the prior would have suggested. Um, and um, it's also probably an indication to the robot that there is a reasonable and feasible way to get the coffee. Because you wouldn't ask the robot to get coffee if you were in the middle of the Sahara, right? Where the nearest coffee is 1,000 miles away. Um, so just the fact that you asked for it suggests that there's probably a, a reasonable way to get it. Um, now, even if the robot is uncertain about many other aspects of the environment, like, you know, it, does, the, does the boss mind if I accidentally crash into this old master oil painting while I'm on the way to get the coffee in the Georges Sank? Um, if the robot doesn't know about that, that's fine, because as long as it leaves those parts of the environment unchanged, it doesn't matter whether it's uncertain about the value of those aspects. Okay? So you get a kind of a minimally invasive solution, and the robot can be useful to humans even in the presence of enormous uncertainty uh, about the overall preference structure. Okay, so how do we, um, how do we solve this problem, right? How, how is the robot going to learn uh, more about the preferences of people by observing behavior? So this is actually not a new problem at all. In AI, it's called inverse reinforcement learning, um, and it's for obvious reasons. It's the inverse of reinforcement learning. In, in reinforcement learning, you are given the reward function, and you try to figure out how to behave to optimize it. Here, you're given the behavior that optimizes it, and you're trying to figure out what the reward function is. Um, it actually has lots of other names. So, so Kalman uh, formulated a, a special case of this problem called inverse optimal control in 1964. Um, in economics, uh, it's called structural estimation of MDPs. Uh, and Tom Sargent and others have worked on that for a long time. Uh, and nowadays, it's very popular. I mean, you just see inverse everything, inverse planning, inverse game theory, inverse you name it. Uh, people are, are trying to solve this problem. So there's lots of useful research on it. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, n it's not quite as simple as, as just learning preferences because there's this coupling between the human and robot behaviors uh, that's important. And so we've actually formulated this as something called a cooperative inverse reinforcement learning game. So you have a human and the robot in the game. And the human has a reward function and in some sense knows it in that they act according to it. But by assumption, they can't explicate it perfectly. And then the robot has to optimize it but doesn't know what it is. So that's the basic structure of the game. Um, and when you solve these games, uh, you observe what you would hope uh, should happen, that the robot has an incentive uh, to do things like asking questions. You know, is it OK if I do this? Um, would you like me to do this or this? You know, which way should I do things? Um, and the human actually is now incentivized to teach the robot, because the human wants the robot to become competent so it can help the human uh, as quickly as possible. Um, and in particular, you know, unlike in standard IRL or all the other variants of inverse everything, uh, the robot shouldn't expect that what the human is doing 
is just solving the problem optimally by themselves. Right? The robot should expect that the human is going to be doing something more like teaching uh, than, than just expert behavior. Uh, and so the, in order to even figure out what the human is doing, you have to think about this in a sort of Nash equilibrium kind of way. Um, so here's just a very, very simple example. Um, right, so uh, there's two commodities, paper clips and staples. And um, in, the, in any particular state of the world, there's P paper clips and, and Q staples. And the human uh, has a preference function, which is just a linear combination of how many paper clips and staples there are. So theta, uh, theta is uh, essentially the, the value of a paper clip. And then 1 minus theta is the, the relative value of a staple. Um, and the robot doesn't know what theta is, so let's say we have a uniform prior. And what's going to happen is the following. Um, the human is going to make a choice, um, in this case, between uh, zero paper clips and two staples, one and one, or two and zero. Um, and then the robot uh, is going to observe that choice, and then it has to choose between these possibilities, right? So it's now going to make some paper clips. And uh, those are the choices it has, 0 and 90, 50 and 50, or 90 and 0. Okay? Um, now, let's suppose, to illustrate this, that um, the human has a slight preference for staples. Right? So a paperclip is worth 49 cents, and a staple is worth 51 cents, if you want to think of it that way. Okay? So if there were no robot and the human had those three choices, right, which one would the human choose? Choose zero two, right? Because it gets two of the things it prefers instead of none or one, right? So it's sort of obvious. Okay, but in this game, the the correct solution is one one, right? If you if you solve the game, uh, you'll find that one one is better um, because uh, with one one, the, when when the robot calculates its posterior over what theta is it's going to end up choosing 50-50, uh, which has higher utility for the human than uh, either of the other two. Okay? And so the, the, in this example, we'll see that the human is behaving, quote, suboptimally uh, in order to teach the robot something. Good. Okay. So we've looked at various uh, forms of cell games. We can generalize to uh, you know, a robot and two humans. Uh, and of course, immediately, uh, now, each human has an incentive to, to be more pathetic than the other one, so it gets more help from the robot. Uh, so we have to figure out you know, good protocols for avoiding these kind of strategic incentives. Um, and how does the robot aggregate preferences? So there's a, a well-known theorem of Hassani saying that um, if you have two agents, uh, sorry, two, I guess, principles um, who have uh, identical priors on the world, the optimal solution for the agent is to do some linear combination of the preferences of, uh, of the two principles. And this is a very famous theorem. Um, but it turns out that actually when you generalize to the case of two principles with different priors uh, about the world, in fact, uh, it, the theorem uh, ends up changing. And the way the robot should behave, uh, it should give weight to the preferences of the principal whose prior turns out to be more accurate. Right? And um, if, you, if you have more than one child, then you already know this. Right? Um, because each child says, I want such and such. I want to go to the movies. Uh, therefore, I believe it's going to rain. And the other child says, well, I want to go to the beach. Therefore, I believe it's going to be sunny. And you can say, fine. You know what? If it's sunny, we'll go to the beach, and if it rains, we'll go to the movies. Okay, uh, that kind of um, contract is reflecting this theorem, right? Um, okay, so there are more complications. I, I'm thinking we don't have time to go through these. I wanted to go through something called the off-switch problem, uh, which comes from a paper that well, the, the general idea comes from a paper of Steve Omohundros. Uh, about instrumental goals. So this is this idea that um, if you give a machine an objective, then, uh, among other things, it will necessarily act in order to preserve its own existence. 
right, for the very simple reason that you, know, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Right? So if you ask the machine to fetch the coffee, uh, it now has an incentive to stay alive. Didn't really have one before. Now it does. Right? Uh, and so um, it won't let you switch it off, even if it's doing something you're extremely unhappy with. Right? Uh, and that's a, that's a kind of behavior we would like to avoid. And it turns out that when you add uncertainty about the objective, uh, the robot behaves differently. So let me just illustrate that um, with another very simple decision problem. All right, so the robot uh, has a choice. It can do this, uh, this action that, that might make you unhappy. We'll call that action A. Um, and it's very uncertain about what the utility of that action is to you. Okay? Um, or it could just switch itself off. Right? It can say, you know, I'm so worried about upsetting people that I think I should just commit suicide before I start. Right? Um, now, we don't want robots to do that either. But you know, if that's the only choices, then uh, we're not particularly happy. So we're going to give the robot a third choice, which is to say to, uh, to the human, I would like to do action A, but I'm going to wait and give you the chance to switch me off. Right? And the question is, why would the robot ever do that? Right? Why would it allow the human to, to switch it off? And the answer is because the the opportunity to be switched off actually conveys information. Uh, and it's a very analogous to non-negative expected value of information. Uh, it's actually a good idea for the robot to do this when it has uncertainty about the value of the action A. Right, so the human's going to say, OK, I can switch the robot off, which gives me guaranteed value of 0. Um, or I cannot switch it off, in which case the robot is going to do action A which has some utility. And now the robot knows that since it hasn't been switched off, the value has positive utility. right? So that part of the distribution goes away. And now the robot can choose action A, knowing that it's better uh, for it to do the action than uh, to switch itself off. Okay? Um, and so you can show that in all circumstances, as long as there's uncertainty, um, that waiting and allowing yourself to be switched off is better than just choosing the action or switching yourself off automatically. Okay? Uh, and this is a very straightforward theorem. Um, and you can also show that if you have such a robot, it's provably beneficial, right? It'll either basically do nothing, um, or it'll do something that's useful to you. So, um, so that's all good. Now, the problem is that. Uh, Solving these cooperative inverse reinforcement learning games, particularly, you know, we can do that in toy worlds, uh, and we can do it under the assumption that uh, the human is behaving, uh, you know, that is solving the, the game. But of course, a human isn't going to solve the real game at all, right? There, there are all kinds of issues about actual human cognition uh, that are going to mess this up. Computational limitations are an extremely important one. Um, so, for example, if you're watching Lee Sedol, you know, at some point in the game against AlphaGo, he made a move after which he was guaranteed to lose, right? Now, he's maybe switched the game theoretic value from plus one to minus one by, by making a bad move. Um, it does not mean that he wanted to lose, right? That's extremely important. So we have to, in other words, in order to understand the choices that humans make, we have to take into account their computational limitations rather than assuming that they were rational uh, in making that choice. Otherwise, we're going to infer the wrong uh, underlying objectives. Um, their, you know, human cognitive structure is also incredibly complex. So to deal with our computational limitations, I think one of, the, one of the things we do is we have a very complicated hierarchical organization of our behavior. Uh, and most of the time, we're only choosing within the small world divine, defined by whatever kind of subroutine we're in in that hierarchical organization. So when I'm giving a talk, I can really only speak. Right? Like it would be very odd if I took out my cell phone and started trading stocks um, or you know, doing backflips on the stage or any number of other things that I could do. Uh, but I'm in the giving a talk thing, so I say words that are relevant to the uh, topic of the talk. Uh, so in order to interpret this behavior, you need to understand what 
you know, where is the human uh, and what is there in, in the hierarchy and what is their hierarchy. Uh, and so that's a lot of work. A lot of people say that uh, you know, humans are nasty, and so any robot that's going to learn from human behavior is, doing, uh, is just going to end up being nasty at the same time. This is not true at all. Right? Um, the robot isn't going to act like the people it observes. We're not doing imitation learning. Right? People can have perfectly respectable goals, like I want to send my kids to college, uh, but still engage in bad choices, like I'm going to do that by extracting bribes from all the people who come through my office. Um, it doesn't mean the robot's going to extract bribes. Uh, it means the robot's going to figure out how to help the person send uh, the kids to college while respecting the preferences of everyone else. Um, so it has an advantage over humans uh, in, that, in that regard. It's, it's purely altruistic. Um, OK, there is one issue that is a problem, which is uh, if the preferences of people include the suffering of others, uh, then I think you probably need to not respect those preferences. Um, and so this is the one place where uh, there is some uh, form of normativity that comes in. This is not purely empirical. Uh, I, th I don't see a way around that, but I'm happy to take suggestions on how to do it. OK, so um, to finish up, uh, what we're really trying to do is to, to redefine AI, right? This is not AI safety as a separate discipline where we sit around nagging the AI people and saying, oh, you know, don't do it that way, don't do it that way, right? We're really saying, change the, what you mean by doing AI, right? So that, you know, we, we are automatically, you know, what good AI means is AI that doesn't do things that make people unhappy, right? Just like bridge, a word bridge means a bridge that doesn't fall down, right? We don't have to keep saying doesn't fall down. That's just in, in the meaning of the word. Um, the other problem that I don't have a solution for is you know, even if we solve all these issues and make perfectly safe AI systems, uh, you know, how, do we get, how do we force people to use them? How do we prevent misuse? That's another. Yeah. Could you say something about unintended uh, second level consequences? So, um, you know, with limited world, limited resources, you can have AI be making immediate good decisions, helping, I don't know, cure cancer. But there could be um, unintended consequences. For example, you cure everybody of disease, then they live too long, we have overpopulation, and so on. So can you say something about second order consequences? Um. So, so those could arise only to the extent that the AI is unable to anticipate them. Um, and so that, that comes back to the fact that there may be limitations on the ability of the AI system to solve the problem F that we're defining. Um, and I think there's, right, there's different ways of saying, okay, you could have, there's, there's humans who are pathetic, there's AI systems which are much better, but there's an, like, still a big gap between the AI system and, this, and the actual solution to the problem F. Um, and you need to ask, are we better off without the AI system at all because it's not perfect? Or are we, I think we're still better off with the AI system that's a good deal further towards perfection than we are. Um, and it should, I, I would think that kind of problem, you know, I mean, you, you, you just anticipated it. Uh, and so that kind of problem should be anticipated. I think one of the, one of the really important f forms of second order effect is, is enfeeblement, right? Um, you call, call this the Wally problem or, uh, you know, in, in E.M. Forster's story, the machine stops. Uh, you know, the human race is enfeebled because we go down a slippery slope of having machines do more and more things for us. And I think the, the most insidious form of enfeeblement is that up to now, for our civilization to proceed, we had to communicate what we know to the next generation. It has to get into their brains. Otherwise, you know, everyone's going to die of starvation pretty quickly, right? Um, when we invented writing, that's a help. We can put it on paper, but it still has to get from the paper into their brains in order for them not to die of starvation. It's no good just sitting in paper without anyone reading and understanding it. Once you have machines with the going, 
by communicating the knowledge to the machines because they can do things unlike paper, right? That to me seems like the most insidious and difficult problem uh, because then you've got a very, you know, in the long term, a very fragile situation where our civilization is no longer propagated through the minds of human beings. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, a problem requiring constant cultural vigilance and work. So it's a great question. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um.